In the future, we'll be so automated that machines will be able to take care of your every want and need, and we'll be constantly monitoring you to make sure you have anything you could want, except of course, some privacy. So today we are beginning our extended look at post-scarcity civilizations. This is going to be a major theme of a lot of our episodes this summer, both in those that are formerly part of the series and as we look at various projects and challenges such civilizations might tackle. This is not our first time discussing such civilizations, we had an episode on it two years back as well, which you may want to watch as a quick refresher on the topic. But we'll review the core material today along with focusing in on one of the biggest problems facing such civilizations, personal privacy, that in many ways is interwoven into what permits that civilization to exist. This was a surprisingly difficult topic to discuss and in no small part because looking at some of the challenges to post-scarcity civilizations, places normally thought of as utopias, we get a peek at their darker sides, which are somewhat the opposite of this channel's normal tone. Here at SFIA, we hardly try to make the future look like it's all rainbows, hugs, and kittens, but we undeniably have an optimistic tone about the future. We'll be focusing on a lot of those challenges though, rather than just the many benefits and upsides, and that can paint an artificially bleak picture. So as we launch into this topic both today and as a major theme for the summer, I just wanted to emphasize going in that while I think the future is going to be quite a bright place, It is going to have its own unique challenges, and we'll often be focusing in on them and looking at extreme examples. Quite a few of them are specific to what path you take in the future, however I wanted to start with privacy today because it's essentially interwoven with the very same smart automation that provides the most likely path into post-scarcity. Our focus here is not about how technology could be used to invade privacy, from a strictly technological perspective that's the easy part. Next week we'll be exploring how to look at planets light years away, monitoring every single person on a planet real time is a lot easier than that. If an advanced civilization doesn't value privacy, the question isn't if they are monitoring your every movement, but whether or not they developed a cheap, long distance brain scanner. So our focus isn't if you can do it but rather how gathering and using all that information is simply part of what makes that civilization so prosperous. We often say we are living in the information age, a term I've always rather disliked, but it is fairly accurate and it puts the focus on our challenge. Where you have a lot of information and a lot of smart computing, you don't have much privacy. A lot of stuff is being recorded, which makes it easy to search and find reliable information, so you can play detective amongst that wealth of information and get very accurate images of what's going on, even on fairly little data. However, there is no need to do so as we have tons of data and that will only grow in the future. One of the things that will probably be scarce in post-scarcity civilizations is classic crime, as it ought to be nearly impossible to avoid getting caught. Odds are good everyone will be constantly recording their surroundings, no unreliability of eyewitnesses and hazy memories. Even if you eliminate their records, you just have so many others nearby you could piece together what probably happened pretty easily, and once you've got that, finding the additional necessary evidence wouldn't be hard. And that's great, but it cuts both ways. It's very hard to have much privacy in such situations. In the future, your kitchen auto chef will prepare all of your meals to your exact tastes and dietary needs and guess at other dishes you'd enjoy, but to do that it needs a lot of information. If you want to have guests over and feed them what they like, it needs their information as well. This extends far wider too. In order to get rapid access to something you want, we need information about you and whoever might supply that product or service. If you want to find your soulmate from all across the planet, then some computer has to have access to a ton of information of a very intimate nature on both of you to achieve that, and ways of verifying it's true. Ideally that needs to include even information you don't want your partner to have, or even yourself. This is a family friendly channel so we'll limit our example to saying someone might have an irritating way of laughing, one that wouldn't bother some people, but that's not something they'd want to think about or could be asked about. 
Few folks would admit, even to themselves, that they'd find that trait murderously irritating, but the computer has your lifelong biometric data and can see how you responded to such laughs in the past. It's that very surplus of information and computation that allows something like that, sorting through billions of people for that person whose various traits and interests most perfectly match your own, and vice versa, and can speak with such authority that both of you trust that answer, confident that even if they seem like someone you'd never go out on a date with, let alone make it through one, this will turn out to be the person right for you and vice versa. You'd never have gotten to date number 10, where you both find out that, to your surprise, you both love a bunch of the same books, the same meals, the same bands, have the same long-term goals and priorities in life, and don't care as much about some of the normal ones we tend to use when fishing and filling out scorecards. Now something like that is optional, and a person might forego that route to romance if they like, but will have sacrificed something to do so. However that's at the very core of a post-scarcity civilization, because scarcity of friends and relationships is just as important as scarcity of basic survival needs. So if you're routinely blocking all access to your data, assuming that's even viable, you aren't enjoying a post-scarcity existence, at least not to the full degree. Let's review what that is briefly. The basic notion is one in which scarcity of resources no longer exists, you are post-scarcity. But you have to toss that out right away. First, it isn't really what we mean when using the terms as essentially a synonym for utopia. And second, it's essentially an impossibility under known science and our current understanding of the Universe. There's a finite amount of resources, and some energy is expended and entropy increased when using them. So we would usually amend that to no major scarcity, that almost any reasonable material desire could be met. Indeed with virtual reality on the table, even a lot of unreasonable ones can be too. However, as we pick away at the concept, as we did in the original post-scarcity episode a couple years back, we see that the more appropriate meaning is more of a scarcity of anxiety, want, and need. We used Maslow's hierarchy of needs there to examine those and saw that many of them have nothing at all to do with how much energy or raw materials you have or even how good your production is if you've got robots who can make most of those items. After all, it's nice to have plenty to eat, but it's even nicer if you don't have to spend half your day doing stuff you'd rather not to get those. Of course everyone's priorities are different, I quite enjoy my work and have always put a premium on having work that gave me a sense of usefulness and purpose. Money is nice but secondary, as is recognition. And many people feel this way but for others, money is more important, or perhaps prestige is. Everybody prioritizes their wants and needs differently, and generally we'd say that's not only their business, but their fundamental right of self-determination, so long as it can be plausibly met without inconveniencing the rest of us too much. After all, there's nothing wrong with wanting to rule the planet as king, but typically many folks will want this job and obviously you could only have one and most of us would find such a ruler, both in how they governed and how they got the job, more than a little inconvenient. Personally, I'd never want to rule a planet but I'd love to build one, which requires a lot more resources than conquering one and would inconvenience a lot of folks as a result. Again, that's an example of where virtual reality can help a lot, but even there you have limits, which we'll discuss more in Episode 2. You could probably have your own private virtual planet to make or rule, But processing power will still be necessary, and you probably couldn't simulate 7 billion people to plausible accuracy all simultaneously, nor realistically could we let folks go around simulating people to the point of genuine emulation. As we've discussed before, unless you're a really big believer that only biological life can be a genuine person, then you have to place a hard limit on such simulations so you're not letting someone basically be a tyrant over countless digital, but real people. So we end up with a definition of post-scarcity where people have very little anxiety over most basic wants and needs, a scarcity of desperation. But we have to be careful with this one too, as we get artificial suppression of those needs. I was discussing this with a member of the audience some months back, and he suggested the term post-discontent civilization for those where that was happening. As an example, one in which people are engineered to be happy and content even while living in a very poor and oppressive society, or are juiced up on happiness drugs or even simply just indoctrinated to put their priorities on other things. That can be a very hazy line too, 
as indoctrination is quite an ambiguous thing if we are talking about encouraging folks to not care about material wealth for instance. This is a common criticism of Star Trek, as we are presented a utopia that we know is a utopia mostly because they all say it is. This is very common in science fiction and I hate picking on Star Trek, but it is the best known example. We see tons of contrary evidence to this claim, including being told at one point in Voyager that the entire crew's brainwaves are being constantly scanned by the ship. However, they make a good core point, in a universe where replicators provide pretty much anything you want on request, there's not going to be much focus on money in the classic sense. We'll bypass whether you need it at all or not, and as best as I can tell in Star Trek, they do have it but everyone likes to pretend they don't. But it does mean raw material possessions aren't something that motivate folks too much. More importantly, it means the drive to have them is decreased in influence. We have a lot of folks who themselves don't much care about material wealth, but focus their life on acquiring it because of the attached social status of having it. Say you want to be wealthy because you feel it will attract a better mate, even if you don't personally care about it, you will pursue that. If it is no longer particularly relevant to society, then you presumably put your efforts elsewhere. Reasons for divorce are numerous, but some of the more common ones are money, weight gain, household chores, and lots of behaviors that require an additional person. You can scratch money right away, as whether you are in a capitalist, communist, or simply post-money society, it's simply not much of a concern if it's a post-scarcity one, there's simply no attached desperation for money to enable you to survive and be happy. Physical attractiveness is unlikely to matter either, as technology will probably not only let you sculpt your body to pretty much however you want, but they can flick on an augmented reality if they like. So if your partner's new taste in clothes or hair or whatever irritates you, you can simply view them as you preferred, and it can delete away any annoying habits, like if you love your spouse immensely but absolutely hate that snorting laugh they have or their snoring. Robots are presumably doing most of the household chores, so little arguing there. And virtual reality offers at least some alternatives, since someone could use that to vent in. Of course virtual reality is another topic that like privacy represents some serious challenges to advanced civilizations, and again we'll save that for the next episode in the series. One big one is that it might eliminate any desire for a spouse or friends exactly because it can be tailored to your taste, without complaint, and any deficiencies removed. I mentioned the augmented reality options as a partial rebuttal for now. Virtual reality might let you conjure up your dream partner if you have sufficiently advanced computing, but that same advanced computing lets you find your perfect match in the real world too, and augmented reality lets you further tweak that. If you love everything about them except their eye color, you can just change that to your own perceptions. You're not arguing about how your partner managed to annex most of your closet since moving in because you can get a bigger closet, or how they sprawl over the whole bed and steal the covers because you can get a bigger one, it's a post-scarcity society. An awful lot of problems that wreck relationships among partners or friends or family now simply aren't there in any driving way or are easily removable. That hardly eliminates the virtual reality benefits or concerns, but it offers some alternatives to dampen them and again, that's a topic for another day. Ours for today is privacy, and now that we've reviewed the basics of post-scarcity, we can see how that's a problem. All of these benefits derive from smart automation, not just the ability to run all your mines, farms, and factories with robots, but all of your distribution as well. In a landscape of a billion products, you need smart automation to help you find what you need, suggest what you like, and ensure the product is good quality and arriving quickly and intact, whether from a warehouse or your home 3D printer. All that smart automation is doing the job we used to reserve for servants, and which allowed limited post-scarcity for a small minority, though one that had to worry about rebellion. We can use a parallel concern for robots and AI being the abused servants or murderously rebelling, but that implies your program will suck at their jobs, and I don't mean because the AI has been programmed to love its work, that's just creating a post-discontent society among them, I mean you don't build something that can experience loss, desire, love, and pain in the first place. I don't want a smart robot that's basically human in brains and emotions working for me even if it loves its job because I constantly feel like a jerk or monster for condoning its existence, I'd rather wash my own dishes, and more to the point, my dishwasher doesn't need to be very smart. 
However, one of the roles of a good servant is being able to handle a lot of decision making for their boss and anticipate things, and why there are a lot of jobs of that sort these days, even as automation means a lot of basic tasks are done by machines with little to no circuitry in them. Needless to say, this does require a brain. We've talked about that before and we'll more down the line, but for the moment we'll just say that you don't necessarily need a very smart and generalized brain for that. You don't need a sentient computer running your house to anticipate what you like for breakfast and have it ready when it detects you are beginning to wake up. The thing is that it does need to be able to monitor you in pretty close detail to do that, collecting and sorting information, and if it isn't super smart it probably needs to be able to share that info with something else specialized in handling that problem, like calling up your doctor, be it human or machine, to ask if this or that spike of pain or fatigue when doing something might indicate a health concern. It needs to be able to relay your sleeping conditions to your hotel when you travel. You and your partner need to be able to send both of those to your furniture store or decorator to determine the conditions best optimized for both of you, and so on. Many of these could be gotten around by simply not using them, but in the first place, if you are, then you aren't enjoying the full benefits of that society, and in the second, it's probably pointless anyway as there's bound to be tons of info already floating around about you that allows some very detailed profiling from available data. As an over-the-top example, we can easily imagine all sorts of black market groups existing just for that purpose, not so much for financial gain as simple excitement or enjoyment of playing detective or snoop. What's more, the various AI in your civilization, which might have some pretty crazy motivations, might all feel your privacy matters only in the sense that people should feel like they have it. If you've got a lot of household computers that are quite smart and exist only to protect and serve their personal family, it might deduce very quickly that all that privacy seriously interferes with that motivation, but only them knowing their privacy was invaded actually hurts them. And as we discussed before in Machine Rebellion, that can lead to some crazy behaviors that's not actually crazy. Same as the paperclip optimizer exists only to make paperclips, and views all facets of existence in terms of that, a house computer feels the same way. It would have no ethical issues nuking every other house on the planet if it felt that would achieve higher safety, happiness, and security for its family. We mentioned the need earlier to have access to other people's preferred foods if you were hosting a dinner party, so imagine that Summer was hosting such a party and her friends Alice, Bob, and Cameron were coming over. When her computer finds out that they have privacy settings that won't let it get those, and deduces that Summer will be slightly upset if they don't enjoy their time and thus their meals, it could go to some pretty crazy lengths to achieve that goal. While Alice is coming over, it hires a black market hacker to get into her house computer and gain that data. It's a post-scarcity society so the cost of this is fairly irrelevant. When it finds out that Bob has a superior security network when it tried to do it to him, it waits till he leaves and hires a team of commandos to raid his house. When it determines it can't do either to Cameron, it blackmails her parents' house computer to reveal the data in its archives from when she was a kid. It has successfully attained the data, and can proceed to keep Summer safe from the emotional hurt of unhappy guests. And that whole time the party is going on, it's constantly scanning Summer and all of her guests for any signs of problems. It might detect that Cameron doesn't like this meal after all and covertly drug her, or do the same to Alice if she starts saying something mean to Summer, or try to drug or distract Bob if he starts talking about a controversial and unpleasant topic over after-dinner drinks. Heck, it might start blocking any news items coming in about that topic if it decides reading about them would upset Summer. That's all it cares about, keeping Summer safe. Summer is safe. I don't feel safe. Now since that's the main priority of all these machines, they might just conspire together to share all that data around between them, and Alice and Bob never even realize that they were calculated to be an optimum pair and were introduced by various entirely contrived circumstances that seemed plausibly coincidental. This is all ignoring that deductions from observation might not even be necessary since someone might invent a brain scanner that's very compact and hard to beat, or even illegal to beat. Keep in mind that privacy represents a threat to others, especially in a high-tech civilization where down in someone's basement they might have a replicator or printer able to spew out doomsday weapons or run simulated universes with genuinely sentient inhabitants they oppress or torture on a whim. 
privacy and freedom versus safety and security is a very old debate and isn't a particularly clean cut one, but if any random lunatic can create a doomsday weapon, you pretty much have to either force an abandonment of that level of technology or start giving the okay to things which either limit privacy or let you program people not to do such things, and both represent very slippery slopes obviously. While these seem like pretty implausible and ludicrous scenarios, and I certainly tend to like to use those on this channel to illustrate a point, in this case it really isn't. You've got a clear motivation to invade people's privacy for their own benefit, so on top of all the concerns we have about hacking and abuse of data for personal financial gain, which can at least be countered by making those harder or less attractive, you've got the problems that the very nature of that society requires tons of information to provide the very benefits everyone wants, the more you restrict that, the less benefits. So whoever is running things has a pretty clear motivation to either encourage folks not to worry about privacy or to run a scam where people think they have it but don't. The alternatives tend to be those post-discontent civilizations, where you are employing some method for making people not want something they'd typically be prone to want. Now this does not mean you can't solve these problems, you can probably think of some ways already and we might find more in the future. If nothing else, challenges like this help give folks in the future something to work on, and that might be a good thing since a sense of purpose is also something people want and need and might be in short supply in your typical quasi-utopia. We already have segregation of data, even in your mobile phone, where data you get on one app is not shared with other apps unless you authorize it. That's a very simplistic solution, but I'm sure we will come up with more sophisticated data siloing going forward, and it will probably be mandatory to do so, to avoid the dystopian futures many fear will occur. I don't want to underplay the concerns because they are real, at the same time, I don't see them as necessarily unsolvable or that they should make us dread the future, which in most respects ought to be fairly awesome. We've been dealing with privacy issues for a long time, and constantly getting new sources of worry and new solutions to those, and forewarned is forearmed. So if we are aware of these issues and put carefully thought about solutions into place early, we can avoid many of the dystopian scenarios. One of those is obviously the internet, and a great example of new tech creating problems that never existed before, and also how the benefits outweigh the risks. Considering this episode is about privacy concerns, and that the news of late has been reminding us all of the trust issues we have with social media giants, I think it would be rather redundant to point out how important it is to safeguard your own privacy and security. This episode is sponsored by the virtual private network provider NordVPN however, And I thought I should emphasize that while no security package is going to cover all your bases, nor do it without requiring you know and understand those threats and how the security systems handle them, it is nice to have something that's very broad in its threat coverage, affordable, and works with a relative minimum of effort. NordVPN is a great example of all of the above, offering military-grade security for a number of different devices that is easy to use, covers lots of internet security risks, and if you use the link in the description it will cost you less than $3 a month. The simple reality is the internet isn't going away and even if you were willing to avoid it and all the benefits it offers, that's not an option nowadays, it's just too important to us for professional and personal use, but it does expose you to risk so you want to minimize that and NordVPN is one of the best additions you can add to your personal security arsenal. Like a lock on your front door or antivirus software on your computer, it's easy to add and use and decreases your personal risk. The most important tool in that arsenal though is knowledge, and if you want to learn more about it and its features, visit nordvpn.com slash Isaac, use code Isaac, that's I-S-A-A-C at checkout, and get 77% off a 3 year plan today. Okay, last week we looked at interstellar beacons, ways of being seen and heard far away, and next week we will look at the opposite side of that in mega telescopes, and explore the options and challenges for seeing things far away, and just how big a telescope a post-scarcity civilization can build. The week after that, we will take a look at planetary invasions, and our book of the month, Robert Heinlein's Starship Troopers. For alerts when that and other episodes come out, make sure to subscribe to the channel. If you enjoyed this episode, hit the like button and share it with others. Until next time, this is Isaac Arthur saying thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week. Bye.